versus Pearson. Thank you, Nova. Dan Pearson with the Cato Institute, but is, as Nova said, I formerly was at the U.S. International Trade Commission. And this question actually relates to that, and it's for Mr. Johnson primarily. When I was at the commission, we went through the grueling experience of imposing anti-dumping order against primary magnesium from China, I think Russia, some of my colleagues probably remember the details. And uh, the U.S. has basically uh, one primary magnesium manufacturer, U.S. magnesium out in Salt Lake, and they use those, the, the salts in the lake to make that magnesium. It's a wonderful operation. I've seen it. Okay? The problem that that order has had is that it, it protects about 400 jobs at, at U.S. Mag. And the last time I saw a number, which I think was 2011 or 12, there had been more than 1,600 jobs lost on the part of U.S. Uh, magnesium diecasters. Okay? Because the those industries were are, the advantage shifted to Mexico and Canada. Some comes in from other countries too, but it was just impossible to take high-priced magnesium and make competitive auto parts in the United States once the anti-dumping duty order went into effect. So, I just put that out there in terms of the effects that an anti-dumping order could have on aluminum, not just for aluminum <coughs> diecasting, which is a big deal, but also for aluminum extrusion. Okay. We really could, could unemploy tens of thousands of people in this country with uh, an anti-dumping duty order that could be fully justified under the law, potentially, uh, on behalf of primary aluminum. So if you have thoughts on that, I'd be glad to hear them. I'll address it briefly. Uh, you're absolutely correct. And that's why I said that as an association, we're trying to be very deliberative and holistic. In, the, uh, in, our, in our search for solutions here. And you can't get into a process of playing whack-a-mole. Um, let me, I'll split this, this response into two parts. For aluminum products, specific aluminum products, there are existing duties on aluminum extrusions. Now, our association did not pursue those exactly. They were pursued by the Aluminum Extruders Council, which is a sister organization. Uh, we have no major position for or against those, those um, those orders, uh, and there's ample evidence that they've been very effective for the extrusion industry. Uh, we represent the entire value chain, and what we're seeing now in the last three years is a precipitous ramp up of flat roll aluminum product uh, from China, both entering the global market and coming directly into the U.S. Uh, and so the, the broad belief within the industry is that it's taken about three years for the shift to happen, but that the production capacity and extrusions in China has migrated then to the flat roll product area in terms of pounds. There's a, there's a related issue based on whether or not those are legitimate exports or whether or not they're in fact fake semis that are being minimally fabricated just for the purpose of export so that they can be remelted in the global market. I won't get into that at the moment. Um, our industry believes that if we're going to pursue those particular trade instruments and solutions that they have to be integrated into a strategic <coughs> approach that protects the entire aluminum value chain, uh, and that is a tricky issue to get at. My final note would be on the WTO uh, uh, case that has been f filed. Uh, the our association uh, is looking for if, if if solutions are pursued at that level, our association wants to protect as much of the aluminum value chain as possible uh, with as strong a case as possible. Uh, with that said, a primary aluminum subsidy case does, at a theoretical level, get at the issue of structural overcapacity in ways that other trade instruments cannot. Excellent. Thank you. I'm going to do uh, two or three questions, and then uh, I think we're going to wrap up from there. Sir, a services question, I know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, hi, Bob Bastien, Georgetown Center for Business and Public Policy, and thanks for a brilliant panel. Um, I appreciate the approaches the aluminum industry has taken to a negotiated solution. I applaud you for mentioning, for the first time today, the acronym WTO. That's, that's pretty interesting. It's very fashionable to visit the WTO these days, in certain circles anyway. And, um, but my, my point is more directed to Rob and to Dan, I think. And that is, um, you, you've outlined, both of you, a con that, that, that you've documented a concentrated, deliberate, Chinese industrial policy to dominate 
technology in your fields and, and others. Um, we don't, I don't think we have a WTO style solution to that, or a countervailing duty or a domestic remedies solution to that. So what are the solutions to that? What are you recommending? What, what can we take away from here that could be acted upon by a new administration to correct what you have documented? Rob, uh, Rob Daniel, I'll have 20 seconds to answer that question. But another question in the room. Do you have another question? Uh, similar question, but for uh, Joseph and Robert, um, the issues that you or the, the industries that you represent were kind of a, a forefront issue for the Obama administration, it would seem, whether in DEP or with China. Do you feel as though, well, first, how important was personnel within the administration at USTR for raising those issues? And, you know, the other side of the same coin of that is, do you feel as though you're now starting from scratch with the Trump administration in terms of raising those issues, which is a relevant question because, as you said, your uh, industries are facing like urgent challenges from China. And then for Ambassador uh, Fetter and, and Charles, if you could just explain some of the challenges that you faced working through these issues with the Obama administration in China and what advice you would have for the Trump administration going forward. Great, 20 seconds, Robin Dan. Chinese industrial policy issues, how to address them. <laughs> okay, really quickly, we have to stop thinking about China as China, and we have to start partnering with cohorts within China that are also being disadvantaged by these structural policies, by the subsidization. Uh, we have to also look outside of the industry itself and look at other factions within China that are also interested in correcting these structural problems. For instance, uh, the, the Chinese government is pursuing solutions for aluminum overcapacity based on concerns about pollution, which was uh, mentioned earlier today. Uh, the energy industry is also looking for solutions for uh, chronic issues within their own industry dealing with baseload uh, electricity consumers. There are many factions within China that can be brought, to, that could be partnered with in order to look for solutions here. Great. Is that 20 yeah. seconds? No, but that's that fine. Uh, so just to be clear, I don't have any industries. We're a think tank. We think about industries. We don't have any. Um, so I think that, look, the key thing, the problem with trade policy is it's, it's, just, it's just run by lawyers. Uh, and, and that works really, really well when you're dealing with a country that has a rule of law. Uh, when you're kind of dealing with a country that has no rule of law and can do whatever they want any time in any way, a legal approach doesn't work. And I think that's what we've seen over the last 15 years. So in that sense, I think what we have to do is move away from these legalistic, you know, should we put tariffs on aluminum or not? You know, I, we probably should, but I don't think that's the point. The point is, should, I think we need constructive confrontation with China to move to a results-oriented system. Stop playing whack-a-mole on individual things. The Chinese have shown very clearly they might lose on one, they'll put two more in their place. I think we have to get the Chinese to just scale back and roll back this kind of ruthless, mercantilist approach that they have. And that's going to take a lot of negotiation and a lot of threats. Uh, I don't think it's going to take uh, you know, this little WTO case or that ITC case. It's going to be a much bigger, more confrontative process. And to know exactly what we're going to say, you can come to our event on March 16th at ITIF, and we'll give you the detailed agenda for what we think the China policy should be. Fantastic. Joe, if you want to talk about the personnel issue. And <laughs> well, as a Go USTR start. alumni, I'm not going to say anything bad about USTR. They're always great. I just hope that the best ones stay. Um, that's always an issue. Um, look, I, one thing I, I would want to say in terms of this new administration uh, and policy uh, and trade policy, um, is something that hasn't been said, which is, uh, well, first of all, like any other industry, we're going to make our case. You know, we represent a lot of jobs. We represent high tech. We represent a lot of value added in the U.S. We're the world leaders, et cetera. And we'll try to get attention on that basis and to our issues, and there's going to be a lot of competition with respect to China. The, the question, I think, is going to be how much bandwidth does the administration have? But the other thing I think as an industry we need to think through is really helping the administration with the negotiating strategy itself. I mean, you know, I, I just have to say just, you know, really frankly, there's been a lot of talk in this room as if, as if none of these ideas and none of this, uh, these issues have ever really been thought about before or that U.S. negotiators never thought through uh, or were unaware of the problems facing us with China and somehow their hands were tied. This stuff isn't easy to do. It's not easy to get solutions. It's not easy to actually come up with concrete ideas to do that. 
And let me just say, I actually date back to the pre-WTO system myself. My first job at the Commerce Department 31 years ago was to put together retaliation lists against countries with whom we had trade problems, okay? And let me just tell you, it was in some ways, uh, there were no lawyers involved in that process. You can put a retaliation list against it on any product you wanted to get to. But what we quickly discovered is there's always an importer on this side of the, on this side of the Atlantic or the side of the Pacific who imports that product, and there's consumers. And it's not as easy as you think to just go out and threaten that we're going to stop all these imports from everybody, and it's not going to have any impact on our economy. And we can just go around and play this game this way. Um, I'm not saying we shouldn't get tougher on, on China. I'm just saying that uh, it's really easy to say we just need to rethink this whole strategy, and it's a lot more difficult to come up with a, a strategy. And I can say that thinking about it with respect to my particular sector, uh, which has a lot of difficult problems. And then, Ambassador Vetter, if you could wrap us up with the challenges. Sure. Um, well, I think that um, the challenge is, first of all, thanks. I think you kind of wrapped up very well. It's a, you can define these problems all day, and I think we worked pretty well to try and do that. The question is, what's the most effective lever that you have to pull to try and get yourself to a solution? And, you know, in the ag space uh, in particular, I think one of those uh, key areas has been that our primary interlocutor in China is often the Ministry of Agriculture who first and foremost has a mandate <coughs> towards self-sufficiency. And in a global food system that, you know, privately those Ministry of Ag officials would say they know self-sufficiency is not, in fact, the way they have to operate their system, they have sort of different political masters and goals than their counterparts and other agencies. And so despite what has been said about the SMED or the JCCT and the fact that these are kind of top shops and too many officials are there, I think there are key ways to leverage those conversations to make sure that you don't just have a single ministry in the room when you're having long-term conversations about the future of sectors. And so when you have commerce officials, when you have their finance officials and others who are looking at broadly where they want agriculture to go in China, what role they want that to play in China's economy, there's a lot more openness to talking about some of these cooperative things and how technology fits in. And so you do need to make sure that you're engaging not just uh, in a narrow way, um, but that others are thinking about uh, the role of agriculture in our relationship. Um, but secondly, I would say in terms of uh, this next administration and what if I were Sonny Purdue and going to be the, the next Secretary of Agriculture, I would be thinking about all of the relationships we already have and using them well. Um, I spent four years as the Deputy Undersecretary for Farm and Foreign Ag Services, so kind of overseeing that foreign ag service relationship, our foreign relationships, and I spent a lot of my time running around the Department of Agriculture with no authority over other undersecretaries who had relationships and money and programs with other countries that were not being used in a coordinated fashion. I think we need to sit down and we need to say, what do we want from China broadly? Not just immediate transactionally, what do we want from them as an ag partner, and what do they want and need from us? And how do the we then engage with them? Because we're sending a lot of money and a lot of expertise and a lot of things over to China just from USDA every year. But we don't do it in a fashion that says, how is this helping China move their needle? How is it also creating a more open and transparent and deeper relationship among our government officials and industries? And so I think we could look a lot more strategically across the government and even just in agriculture at all those relationships we have and uh, trying to create some real uh, win-win situations for them. Ken, you can take it away or we can do what, one advice to the administration down the line. All right, well, that, that sounds great. Let's do one advice, uh, or you can do more than one word, but maybe like two sentences. Plastics. Plastics. <laughs> <laughs> Moving them. There we go. Uh, my one advice would be uh, the Goldilocks strategy. Uh, you know, frankly, in my view, we've been way too soft on China. If you tilt to the exact opposite, that's not going to work. Uh, you cannot alienate them so badly that they just dig in and do nothing. But sort of doing what we're doing, which is to, you know, plead with them. I don't think that's working either. So something, something, something like a golden black strategy that's tougher than we are now, but not so tough that it alienates them. I think is the key uh, way to go. Um, I guess I'd echo that. I, I'd say um, again, as someone a former negotiator, um, try to think through the end game before you start your strategy. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
look for solutions that are not based specifically at the U.S. border, whether it's the geographic border, the trade policy border, or the cultural border. And then also look for solutions that are not zero sum, that increase the size of the pie. Uh, I guess persuasion, cooperation, and not coercion. Fantastic. We're always about trying to increase the size of the pie.